All right. So, Jan Slavi is a professor of philosophy of mind and philosophy of emotions at Free University Berlin. As a co-initiator and project head of the Effective Societies Research, Research Center, he has published internationally recognized work on affect, naming two of, I want to say, innumerable papers on the topic are the formative effective arrangements together with Rainer Mühlhoff and Philipp Büchner in Emotion Review 2019 and Relational Affect in an edited volume, How to Do Things with Affects, Leiden 2019. Jan has co-edited the publication of the key concepts of the Effective Societies Research Center with Routledge in 2019 and is currently working on a follow-up edited volume on the topic of affect and its institutions together with Millicent Churcher and Sandra Corkins. Beyond his work at the center, Jan is a veritable Heidegger scholar and is engaged together with others in stimulating more discussions around racism, the climate crisis, and academic philosophy's relation to it in the context of FU Berlin's Institute of Philosophy. Jan's talk today is entitled Untapped Negativity affects the white world and the generativity of destruction. Thanks, Enrique. That's too generous. And uh, well, I wanted to use a longer break after Tamar's talk to actually shorten my paper a little bit. So now you have to endure the, the longer version. Uh, apologies in advance. Towards the end of Black Skin, White Masks, Franz Fanon writes that, quote, the disaster and the inhumanity of the white man lie in the fact that somewhere he has killed man. It is easy to gloss over this line since it has an almost casual tone to it, despite what it expresses. It can also deceive readers that the sentence appears within a passage in which Fanon seems to propose in what almost looks like a symmetrical fashion to both the formerly enslaved and the descendants of slaveholders that a march toward a common future in freedom unburdened by the shackles of a brutal past should be the aim. Yet in fact, what Fanon does is to articulate the fateful relationality of founding violence and its ongoingness for both of its relata and quite explicitly for the position we designate as white. Somewhere he has killed man. The ambiguity is instructive. Man, we should probably say human, has been killed the black man, but thereby the humanity of the killer has been eradicated. The colonizer now bears the stigma of, the, of his brutal deed, his manifest inhumanity from now on evident, no matter how meticulously this fact will be erased again and again by the ruling episteme. Moreover, Fanon says somewhere, somewhere the white man has killed man, not some time before, but somewhere, someplace, someplace else. And we do well to assume that the present tense matters here, that at the border, at the border zones of the world, at the edge of white consciousness, the killing continues. To quote Hortense Spillers, the human subject is murdered over and over again by the passions of a bloodless and anonymous archaism showing itself in endless disguise, end of quote. There is no moving on, no unburdened looking ahead that would not be tethered to this brutal scene. As such historical dynamism or generative grammar, the white world built out of and etched into the flesh of the enslaved is not an extant formation frozen in time, but an incessant dynamism, a life protocol of ongoing destruction. Untapped negativity, as I clumsily call it, is meant to express the differential reenactment and energetic recharging of genocidal violence in ever new forms, the inexhaustible wellspring of destructivity and negative virtuality that lies at the core of what Fanon calls the white world. So this is what I try, what I'm trying to get at with this strange title. When some iterations of affect theory celebrate the virtual in a shallow Bergsonian register as a positive potentiality for change and celebrate affect's transformative thrust, what remains unthought is the virtual's abject undercurrent, the generativity of destruction, the incessant productivity of the negative. 
Affect theory, when it looks to reveal the potentialities of worlding, should reconsider its grasp of possibility. It should retrain its focus on the ongoingness and inventiveness of modes of violent world-making, of how the genocidal order of colonial modernity reproduces itself and how this order conscripts subjects and renders them complicit in ever new ways, even in places and contexts that seem far removed from actual violence. So for me, as someone committed to working with the concept of affect, Tyrone Palmer's paper, Otherwise Than Blackness, has instigated thought on the destructivity of worldly settings and, how, and on how construals of affect might help us see them better and truly grasp them, a grasp that goes beyond nominal or propositional understanding. So you see, I'm very, I'm a simply minded thinker, so I try to just invert uh, the thrust of Tyrone's paper in, in a fashion that at least for now is certainly under complex. So I will offer some notes to this effect, talking about world and world making, about work on whiteness in critical phenomenology, and about the effect theoretic potential of Alexander Vihely's concept of racializing assemblage. How to halt affect theory's flight from the negative and refocus it so that it might face both the quotidian and ontological brutality of the white world and its modes of living in their collusion with anti-blackness and thereby hopefully come eye to eye with um, work on black affect as some, some sort of otherworldly or out of the world modality. So the first passage is called abject worlding and I try to shorten it on the fly. Um, so th this is basically about a uh, response to Tyrone's paper on the concept of world. And I want to just as a, as, a, as an introductory remark here, say that I'm that it can be kind of remarkable how uncritically much of mainstream philosophy and academia as such uses the register of world, world making, worlding, particularly recently, um, in order to express positive things and re rather uncomplex, un un undialectical positivity. But it's, I think it's obvious that who says world nearly always says too much and too little at the same time. Too much because world as an integrated totality in reach of human praxis and comprehension carries a grandiosity of ambition and assuredness about relational capacity and extant meaningfulness that seems out of step with the de facto limitations of access and with the rampant incoherence, fragility, and antagonism that beset humanly accessible domains of practice and dwelling. And they say too little either, because world in its evocation of harmony, wholeness, and order glosses over the conditions of origin and continuance of the domains it designates and is silent on what happens at the border zones, is silent on the specifics of the world's relations to an outside silent on the work force and often brutality that needs to be invested in order to create even a semblance of harmony well-orderedness and intelligibility so the concept of world is idealistic to say the least one suspects that it's having gone unquestioned by and large is further evidence for the complicity of intellectual production in the dominant mode with the order of colonial modernity world as an operator of conceptual harmonization moves in once a brute physical ordering and hierarchization of bodies and space has made its initial forays. Now, turning to Tyrone's paper, I'm, I'm not sure whether Tyrone is right with his insistence that the question of affect, and here I already quote him, the question of affect is indelibly tethered to the question of the world, that one cannot conceptualize affect without a supplementary conceptualization of the world as the ground of its unfolding or that and it's all quotations here that the relationship between affect and world takes the status of an organizing law i'm not sure but for today i just want to keep these connections and propose to invert its thrust as affect as tethered to world might help us think the negativity of world making the investment in protocols of destruction that are part and parcel of world making and world maintenance in the dominant modalities. But for, first, a brief note on affect as a concept. And here I, I could say a lot. I'm really you know, intrigued by, by the critique. Um, 
But I think, but I think we do better to understand affect not as tied to a specific range of concepts as Tyrone suggests. So the concepts of world, of becoming, of possibility, of affirmation, um, of relationality, and so on, but rather as something that slides across the terrain of cultural production in its entirety, enabling connections with various key terms in that terrain. Power, the subject, the body, discourse, materiality, time, history, praxis, cultural imaginaries. Each of these can be articulated with affect so that a conceptual complex results that can be put to specific use. So I read Tyrone's intervention as one that strives to disarticulate some of the prominent connections that have been made in the field. Affect world, affect meaning, affect possibility, and affect affirmation among them. Thereby, he opens up the terrain for other connections. For instance, affect domination, affect negativity, affect blackness. And I would keep the parent affect and relation in play as some sort of, there you could say that might be a grammar, but there are other relationalities and thinkable than the ones that are, yeah, premised on positive connection and, you know, the sort of positive relatedness of the encounter and so on and so on. So I'd suggest now to employ affect exactly in order to articulate and concretize the negativity of world and world making. The possibility of, quote, affect outside and against the world, non-relational affect, black affect, might indeed dis disarticulate a conception of affect as positivity, potential, and transformative energies. But these two options, the mainstream option, affect as affirmation, tethered to world where world is positively connoted, and black affect as world destructing negativity, do not exhaust the spectrum. Affect is operative also in the world as a driver of the world's ongoing destructivity, its foundational anti-blackness. So while black affect is constitutively inconvertible into the currency of worlding, such worlding itself comes with its own incessant yet routinely disclaimed and evaded affective dimension. Forms of attachment to the world's ordering of reality and thus conscription in the execution of the protocols of destruction and exploitation, however, shielded and buffered from acknowledgement, from explicitness, uh, these might be. While affect is adhesive to word precisely in so far as the word ensures whiteness as social positionality and mode of living. So when Tyrone in a gripping passage spells out the desire of the black radical tradition for the end of the world, quote, a desire for the destruction of the world as a horizon of possibility, then one can hold this desire for the world's destruction against its mirror image. And I think that's on, on the level of discourse that Tyrone operates on almost trivial, that this mirror image is a desire for the world's continuance and investment in its logics and outcomes. And here we talk about formations of consciousness and configurations of being that manifest the dominant mode in its quotidian routine and normalcy. This is a white investment in colonial modernity its stewardship of a genocidal order. On this perspective, affect does not figure as an escape from the ongoingness of colonial modernity, although it of course is deployed and used as such, um, but as part of its vital, maybe even thereby, as part of its vital tissue and generative potential. Affect is part of the sensuous endowment of the dominant positionality in a very complex manner. So I. I presume when it comes to the concept of world, I'm in agreement with Tyrone, although he might be less interested in the vagaries of an analytic of white being in the world. And when Tyrone asks, can a theory of affect outside the mandate of, uni of a universal capacity for relation be articulated? What I question is the universality assumption concerning relationality. The challenge for the perspective I'm interested in is to conceive of a destructive relationality or its ver various modalities of destructive relationality, a parasitic, consumptive, and extractionist relationality that helps to understand the operative logic of dwelling in the world and the grammar of world making as it continues the order of colonial modernity. Here, a notion of effort can help us frame one side of the equation, at least, namely those modes of immersive engagement in frameworks of meaning 
in design spaces and in institutional landscapes, in a cultural imaginary, in a discursive grammar, in an economy of desire, all premised, um, however indirectly and remotely, on anti blackness. Now, from this, I jump into a snippet on critical phenomenology that I think is in part maybe promising, um, promising line of work that one can take up here. So the past years have seen a number of works emerge that belong to what could be called a Fanonian phenomenology of whiteness. These works seek to convey the collusion and complicity on a spectrum between unwitting perpetuation, cold-blooded acquiescence, and open enjoyment of Western middle-class modes of living with racist violence, structural exploitation, and the legacies as well as present realities of genocidal conditions. I call these approaches Fanonian, not primarily because of Fanon's phenomenological credentials, but because, but because of what Fanon offers over and above phenomenology, a historical ontology of the color line and its psycho-existential workings on both sides, and its methodological invocation of sociogeny as methodologically prior to philo philo phylogeny and ontogeny. I briefly talk about one exemplary text from this growing canon, in her 2019 paper, Seeing Like a Cop, Liza Günther deploys some aspects of this Fanonian register to outline an analytic of an existential style she calls investment in whiteness as property. By that, Günther refers to modes of living, the predominant Western brand of personhood as property, self-possession plus world orientation in the possessive acquisitive mode. I own myself and I moreover am what I own. Such Lockean possessive individuality manifests today in modes of living that collude with state-sanctioned anti-Black violence. This underside of these existential modes is being held at a distance from conscious acknowledgement through a number of safeguards so that the de facto stakeholders of extractive, accumulative world-making find themselves buffered for the most part from awareness and acknowledgement of what their livelihood is based on. Thanks to these imperfect safeguards, which are often effective, the actors in question might variously be ignorant or credibly claim ignorance, engage in open or tacit forms of victim blaming, resort to liberal narratives of incremental progress, or openly sign up with the, the violent order and cheering on um, a right-wing agenda to that to that part, but also on the other side engage in emancipatory projects of decolonization all the while they continue to be in, in existentially invested for being in social positionality in that insidious structure. Günther draws on Cheryl Harris' legal history of whiteness as a property interest, on Du Bois' reflections on the social and cultural wages of whiteness, and on Fanon's and Sylvia Winter's understanding of sociogeny, and also too briefly, I think, on Melo Ponty's notion of institution, institution as a founding event that issues a call to a following more than a stable social arrangement. I cannot go into these details, but this is what I think is a promising alternative set of sources for carving out an analytic of affect that might deserve its billing as Fanonian. I can only hint at a few select aspect, aspects from this confluence of dimensions. Günther continues in the key of Sarah Ahmed's phenomenology of whiteness, which turned on a reading of Husserl's natural attitude as the many natural seeming modes of unperturbed, expansive bodily dwelling in white space. And Günther likewise starts from the cultural primacy and obviousness of carefree, entitled, and pleasurable absorption in insecuritized white space, and then hones in on how such orientations come with a tacit yet witting acceptance of state-backed violence to shield, foster, and perpetuate that arrangement. She asks not only how it is to dwell in spaces of privilege, but focuses on the mindsets of complicity. In the register of the agencies of the urban gentrification machine, the mindset is one of buying in, signing up cognitively, effectively, existentially to the present-day iteration of the racial contract as it spreads through the terrain of the social, the economic, and the political. And here I think investment 
it's is a, is a helpful concept because it combines reference to a lifestyle primed on financial investment with its specific temporality, linear temporality focused on growth, systemic dependence, and also effective texture, anxiety, restlessness, hunger for more, but also an invocation of very real financial institutions that have their own well-documented history of blatant racist discrimination and neo-colonial extraction. This with, with a, an understanding of investment, obviously in a more figurative sense, yet also quite evident sense of devotional commitment to a way of being. You can openly commit to a lifestyle and mode of world appropriation, but likewise be invested in a manner that simultaneously disclaims that investment or lets it sink into a mode of unthinking equations. Accordingly, investment, much more than notions of experience or consciousness, gets closer to the depths of involvement with and complicity in an historical social structure as it marks the very complex zone at which individual experience and practical orientations overlap with the protocols of the worlds that enable, endow, protect, and shield, and shield these modes of living. Outwardly, it is manifest as a set of perceptual practices and orientations that Günther locates between seeing like a cop and calling the cops, the continued con counting on the differential allocation of protection and persecution on part of the state, state-backed violence. More generally, seeing like a cop is a stand-in for the entire fabric of disciplined and disciplining, composed, organized, securitized living in the dominant mode. Whiteness as opting for safety instead of life, to quote James Baldwin. And we can maybe begin to measure the distance between this work and Afro-pessimist political ontology, if we put it next to Frank Wilderson's line that Günther also uh, invokes, that quote, white people in their very corporeality are the police. And while I'm, I think it's promising to do critical phenomenology, I think it needs to be conceptually more rigorous and it needs to be put to a different conceptual register to really get at the material and power inflected or domination inflected operations of affect. So in what might seem like a backslide to Tyrone, I want to invoke his PhD advisor, Alexander Vaheli, um, namely Vaheli's concept of racializing assemblage and propose an affect theoretic appropriation of it. Vaheli recrafts the Deleuzean notion of agencement into his concept of racializing assemblage, thereby dissociating Deleuze's concept from, in his own words, quote, the snowy masculinist precincts of European philosophy. And part of what Alex Vaheli achieves, I think, is the following. He harnesses the productive energies of the Deleuzean conceptual universe, especially the idea of a dynamic generativity of socio-material and socio-political arrangements, arrangements that span material and discursive registers that are performative in ways uncontainable by a discourse centered on practice and intentionality that are historically long in the making, but become expressive at particular moments in time, after which they recede into the virtual, where they continue to resonate through the cultural terrain, spawning ever new effector app apparatuses, discursive devices, and also effective modes of appeal, desire, fascination, and so on. As a designator for race itself, its centrality, contingency, and generativity throughout the history of Western humanity, the concept of racializing assemblage connects a significant portion of species history with very concrete arrangements of violent subjection. On the face of it, race and racializing assemblages are, quote, a set of sociopolitical processes of differentiation and hierarchization which are projected onto the putatively biological human body and thereby, quote continues, discipline humanity into full humans, not quite humans and non-humans. They represent, among other things, the visual, but also the discursive, linguistic, institutional, bodily, and imaginative modalities by which, quote, dehumanization is practiced and lived. So I think racializing assemblages offer a perspective on the generativity of destruction that can bring a notion of affect to bear as an element in a much larger conceptual array. So within a wider analytic that links an ontological with a quotidian register. Affect is involved in a material register as violence and its aftermath, that at the same time works symbolically as cultural grammar and hieroglyphics of the flesh. Affect here comes in view as one factor in an incessant cultural production that, to quote Horton Spillers again, 
remains grounded in the originating metaphors of captivity and mutilation, so that it is as if neither time nor history nor historiography and its topics show movement as a human subject is murdered over and over again by the passions of a bloodless and anonymous archaism showing itself in endless disguise." End of quote. Racializing assemblages involve subjects and, and embodied subjectivities, only elements, parts of subjects, in selective yet precisely designed ways as their operators, embodiments, legitimators, stakeholders, as those whose being is conditioned by the symbolic sequence written in blood to again use Spiller's words. Racializing assemblages offers a more rigorous analytic than phenomenology taken on its own, but this analytic can recruit phenomenological elements into its fold. So this is what I think Liza Günther is doing by and large, although she could say more on the generativity of whiteness as a quote, the Haley series of hierarchical power structures that apportion and delimit in ever new and insidiously inventive ways, which members of the homo sapien species can lay claim to full human status. End of quote. Vihely himself uses Spiller's notion of flesh as the anchor and intensifier of racializing assemblage. The flesh is where the relationality of destruction meets both its target and its limit, its other, its end. And this is also where Vihely locates the end of the world. So let me end by quoting him again. In the absence of kin, family, gender, belonging, language, personhood, property, and official records, among many other factors, what remains is the flesh, the living, speaking, thinking, and feeling, and imagining flesh, the ether that holds together the world of man, while at the same time forming the condition of possibility for the world's demise. It's the end of the world. Don't you know that yet? Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Jan. So much to think about. Um, thank you.